I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight for Marilyn Sommerdorf, who's doing a talk on Dining on the Rails. This is a program that is co-sponsored by the Renaissance Society of Sacramento and the Sacramento River Delta Historical Society. We're gonna tell you about more, uh, more about those organizations in just a little while. I wanted to introduce Marilyn and um, let you know that we have a little bit of problem today in terms of making sure that uh, we could see screens, so I'm going to be handling a PDF for her, which means I'm going to be scrolling. She's going to be talking, and then she'll tell me when to go to the next slide. So, Marilyn, I am so delighted to have Marilyn here. She is the go-to person for any of us that are involved in railroad history. She knows, I think, everything. I usually would call <laughs> or ask her before I would even ask the librarians at the California <laughs> State Railroad Museum. She was an interpreter there, but that is not in any way uh, claiming what it was that, um, that she did because she set up a lot of the exhibits for the Railroad Museum uh, and especially some of the ones on the dining and rail car history. One of the things that I love about her is that unlike me where I get very California centric and California railroad centrics, there's not much that she doesn't know about railroads all across the country. And um, we're delighted. She has incredible uh, photos that she's going to be sharing. This will be recorded and you will all receive a link. So what I'd like to do is Marilyn, just have you say hello while I am starting to set up your screen. Well, thank you, Mary Ellen. Uh, it's really a pleasure and greetings to everyone who is, uh, who's on this Zoom. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I appreciate it, and I hope you'll enjoy the uh, program tonight. There's uh, one thing, though, I, I'm anxious to know if you have eaten dinner first, because this might make you a little hungry. Um, are we ready to go, Mary Ellen? The answer was yes. I'm sorry, I muted myself. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, here I can't get. There's a couple people on here. I can't get myself on. But anyway, that's okay. Um, I'll just turn myself off. So uh, tonight's program. Um, can you make it a little smaller, or is, or is that me? I'm. Mary Ellen, it's uh, it's kind of off the page. Is is that uh, okay? I'm going to shrink this down and see what other. How does that? That's better. Uh, I still am not seeing the black edge on the top and the bottom. Uh, I'm not sure why. that we're. Uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there you go. Okay, all right. So tonight uh, I'm going to be talking about railroad dining. I want you to come along in a culinary adventure. So I didn't realize that we were having two co-hosts, but I did say it's the Renaissance Society and it is May, 2021. I've researched and produced this program uh, as a railroad historian. Next. Could you go ahead and Marilyn, Marilyn has uh, uh, muted herself. Marilyn needs to yeah. unmute herself. Okay. <laughs> All right. Are we back? You're back. Okay. So let's go to the uh, next slide. This is uh, an interesting one from, um, I have to tell you, it's uh, Santa Fe Super Chief. It's a publicity photo. See, I can't see the bottom of my screen, so I'll just have to tell you what it is. And um, the super chief was an all first class. I'm sorry, but somebody's talking. 
Is that is that somebody talking or shall I go on? All right, so I'm just going to ask our uh, assistants to please make sure that everyone is muted and has their things off so we can just get Marilyn. Thank you. Uh, right. We just keep having people join that aren't muted. I'm trying to oh, catch I them. I see. Oh, oh <laughs> lucky you. <laughs> okay. So the Super Chief was an all first class train. It was the last, um, you know, the dining car was the last major passenger car to come into general use. Next. Oh, I know what it is, Mary Ellen. Put it on single page. And then I think we'll be fine. So the talk tonight will span the years from 1868 to 1971. 71 is when Amtrak took over passenger car service in the United States. Next. I call this my Alpha and Omega slide because on the left we have um, the Streamliner era. It's actually a business train from uh, Southern Pacific at the time and Amtrak on the right. So you've got the older and modern uh, here in uh, Sacramento. Ah. Next. <laughs> so we'll talk about early food service and that uh, includes the uh, depots and restaurants along the line of uh, various railroads. This was uh, quite early before dining cars were established. Next. Uh, this is uh, somebody uh, who was a great talent. I wish I car could cartoon like this. You can see that um, it says a limited express, five seconds for refreshments and everybody's pouring out of the cars. They can't get through the door. And then they're back on the train and they're saying, wow, um, it's uh, interesting because the station name is Choke em Off. Uh, there's um, next. So you see the um, early dining and this one, this particular uh, dining room is in a railroad hotel in Laramie. It was taken by the famous photographer, A.J. Russell around 1868, which is just before the Transcontinental Railroad was open. So this is the Union Pacific Railroad side. Next. And of course, Southern Pacific or Central Pacific also had uh, stations along the way. Boy, eat in 25 minutes. So there you go. And uh, that's, uh, they thought it was a pretty good deal. Uh, supplying a beautiful fountain in the bar room of spring water. So that was nice. Next. There were restaurants along the way, many of them owned by the railroad, some uh, just contracted by the railroad. Early on, Fred Harvey created restaurants along the Santa Fe Railroad. Uh, he started in uh, Topeka, Kansas and moved on. The photograph on the right is one of his restaurants at Union Station in Los Angeles quite a bit later. And they now still have this, this uh, restaurant it's not Fred Harvey anymore, and it's been redecorated. So I like the historic look of it. And in this picture, he, he provided food service for the other grand hotels that uh, Santa Fe had. They had them at the Grand Canyon and many other places. This is a breakfast menu for the El Tovar Hotel, which is still there. And incidentally, I'll show you a picture of the woman who designed it later. Next. So we finally get to dining car service. And it was in the early days, uh, special trains, first class trains, and they had something called the hotel and buffet cars. Next. 
the hotel buffet cars, uh, uh, many of them were produced by, by uh, Pullman Company. They had uh, food service in one end and uh, hotel accommodations, in other words, sleeping and sitting quarters in another area. The uh, pantry was often quite small like this, and sometimes they couldn't even uh, um, they couldn't even uh, um, cook anything. It was all prepared and then just just given to the passengers. Uh, next. So um, I don't know, but Mary Ellen, maybe because you're on uh, continuous instead of single page, you might be able to fix the PDF that way. Try, you might try it. Here we have an early car. This is 18, late 1860s, early, I think 1872 maybe. You see tables between the, um, the uh, um, seating area, those could be removed. And then above the people, the slanting part are the upper berths that would come down at night. And then in the back of the photo, you see the bar. Next. I just wanted to let you know that I cannot mess with the PDF while you're talking. I'll do it when we take that break. Oh, perfect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Dining car service. So let's uh, get into the service next. Uh, I'll read this since it's not all on the screen. Uh, you can see the photograph. The contrast between the depot restaurant and the dining car was remarkable. To the good food, good service, and pleasant surroundings of the diner was added the enchantment of the passing landscape. Few other places can induce the same feeling of serenity and well being than the seat on a railway dining car. It was, in many travelers' experience, one of the most civilized pleasures created by Western society. This quote is from. John H. White Jr. is a well-renowned railroad historian and wrote the book um, on the passenger car. It's so big and heavy, I have to read it on the floor, but it's wonderful. He's a great historian, worked for Smithsonian. Next. The Union Pacific Dining Dome Car had a lower level of dining. So you can see it here. The woman in the red sweater or jacket at the far end is coming down the stairs of the upper dome. Look at those nice, comfortable seats. Next. The uh, Santa Fe had a special car that they uh, put on the end of the, of the um, the super chief, it was called the Pleasure Dome. And here you had a small restaurant that you had to make reservations for. It was called the Turquoise Room. Many celebrities used it to have their dinner between Chicago and Los Angeles. Here you see a celebration of a birthday uh, in the Turquoise Room. They even had the Membrano China, but they also had a place setting plate that had the same style of icon that you see on the wall for the turquoise room. Next. This is a busy photo. Notice uh, men's hats have a place on the, above the windows. There's uh, the steward watching over in the aisleway, and the waiter is very attentive. And here's this man pouring his tea from his little single um, pot, which was uh, given to passengers who got tea. And also, uh, there were coffee pots, individual coffee pots for passengers. Next. Well, I mentioned that uh, there were uh, special trains. This happens to be a special car. 
the Gold Coast, the California State Railroad Museum has the car, it was donated to them. And that was very instrumental in getting the Railroad Museum's funding. You notice on the left, we have the distinguished uh, governor at the time, uh, Ronald Reagan, and on the right, who of course later became our president, and on the right, Dr. Denny Ansbach, who was a real mover and shaker for the Railroad Museum. Next. In contrast, isn't this a sweet painting by Norman Rockwell? It's called The Diner. And he's got his little purse and he's looking at the menu, uh, trying to figure out what he can afford and everything. And I love the waiter because he has such a great smile on his face. It looks like he's being so patient with this young man. Next. Well, you can't have food service aboard the train without a lot of support that's not on the train. So I mentioned the commissaries and Fred Harvey, who was, of course, a, a uh, contractor with Santa Fe, and he had his own commissaries with, with Santa Fe and the Pullman Company which again uh, supplied uh, sleeping cars and buffet cars. They had their own food commissary and they were um, contracted to operate on various railroads. Next. These two photos are from uh, Northern Pacific. The one on the top has a young man probably couldn't He's probably too young to work nowadays. And he's in the uh, car supply in the Northern Pacific Railway Commissary, probably there to polish silver. Look at all the silver on those shelves. The bottom right is the man uh, putting something in or taking something out of the oven is Fred Kroll, K-A-U-L, Master Baker for the Northern Pacific Railway Commissary in Seattle. He was famous for making all their fruitcakes. I know people don't necessarily want fruitcakes anymore. Next. All the dining cars had to be stocked. This is one in 1952 being stocked at the commissary in St. Paul. If they had extra passengers that they hadn't counted on, they could restock between uh, St. Paul, they'd go to Chicago, back to St. Paul and Minneapolis, and then on to Seattle. Uh, they could stop in Livingston, say, and uh, take on more food. This is uh, just part of what they, the the uh, waiters and cooks uh, dealt with. Next. Well, this is uh, apropos, we're gonna talk about the staff a little. There were chefs and cooks and waiters, a steward um, and the dining car department. I have uh, added them because although they didn't ride the car, they provided training to keep uh, standards up for the trains, for the railroad. And one of the standards was coffee. It was very important how you made coffee and it was, um, you know, a standard across every train and car. Next. Oh, yum. I'm beginning to get hungry already. This is the kitchen where the magic of fine meals was created. It's often uh, compared with a ship's galley. You can see why it's very narrow and everything is in its place. Uh, there's no wasted space. Uh, this shows just three of, three people working, but as many as uh, four or maybe more could be in that kitchen and they're all working very hard. Um, it looks like uh, possibly that's a Santa Fe photo because of the uh, china that's uh, on, the, on the counter. Next. This is a Union Pacific uh, uh, waiter. 
He's in the upper dome. You can uh, behind him see the, um, his little pantry. He would get the food and finish it off in his own pantry and serve it. Next. This is a, a very simple drawing of the passenger cars, the Cochiti, that was the first one made for the Super Chief. And it's at the California State Railroad Museum. And in the middle of June, you'll be able to walk through it once more. It had seating for 36. Later on, uh, cars were extended, made longer, and they had seating for 48. The right-hand side where the uh, lockers are, where you come in, that was the stewards area. The tables were seating for four or seating for two. Even in the restaurant business, they call those deuces. The buffet was at the opposite end of the seating area. Again, every single space was used for refrigerator or other kinds of storage. The kitchen and pantry are not shown um, you know, in detail, but you do see that in order to get uh, to the other end of the train, you'd go by a narrow passageway and mm, the smells would be emanating from the kitchen. Next. This is a, a, a counter, a lunch counter. These were put on these trains to help economize as uh, the railroads spent an awful lot of money on dining cars. They were the heaviest car in the train that carried all this material. And uh, for every dollar they brought in from a meal, the railroads normally paid out about a dollar 44. So they didn't make any money. They were losing money. The waiter here most possibly is the waiter that uh, would be head of this particular car. There'd be no steward. Next. You can see in this, uh, in this car that uh, the steward's on the left, he's in the, uh, in the dark suit and the waiters, it's like a dance. They all knew how to work around all of this. You notice the waiter has a tray uh, and you can imagine what it must be to serve on a sway jolting dining car. Next. Again, um, Northern um, Pacific photo. Jack Oliver is on the right. He was in charge of the dining cars. He loved all his crews. He's pictured here with a crew from uh, <clears throat> one of the dining cars. You can see the waiters, the steward, and the three cooks, the chef actually, and two cooks. Next. I, I do need to mention that Northern Pacific was the first uh, railroad to, to promote uh, Black Americans to the position of steward. You, well, in the tradition of the railroads, the Capitol Corridor has uh, this particular cafe car and a friendly uh, attendant named Herman. Herman loved people, and you could see he would decorate his area for all kinds of, of holidays and special events. This one happens to be Easter. Thank you, Herman. Next. The food. Uh, here we have the kitchen and pantry. We'll talk about some specialties preparation and recipes, yum. Next. Before we go into the kitchen, I wanted to say one thing about the pantry area. It's a very small area. However, all the waiters used it. They prepared salads there. Sometimes they cooked the uh, boiled eggs. 
and the uh, final uh, finishing of the food before it was served was done here. Oh, this is uh, some of those great baked potatoes coming right out of the oven uh, on the uh, Northern Pacific. This was their specialty. They're huge. And I don't think we could probably maybe split one in half and get it down. And they're huge, but beautiful and good, they said. Next. I like this image. It shows the three cooks and the chef all working together. Notice the kitchen now, it's more modern and it's stainless steel. The kitchen had all the items, the pots, the pans, the utensils, the knives, everything. And in the far right back, you see the dish drainer. And so they washed all the dishes aboard the train and they had lockers for clean linens and soiled linens. Next. A Union Pacific waiter up on the upper part of the car and making toast. So he's got the jam and jellies all ready to go. And he's just uh, putting the toast together to serve someone breakfast. Next. Well, I couldn't resist not putting in one recipe. I know you can't uh, have time to write this down, but the salad bowl from Southern Pacific Company was a specialty of theirs as uh, people wanted to eat more healthy. So here's the recipe for the salad bowl and it serves six. I didn't notice a recipe for the French dressing. So I guess you can make your own. The bowl on the left is the salad and you see the napkins, they're not paper, but they do say Southern Pacific on them. Next. So Marilyn, I just wanted to let you know that I snapped a picture of this and I will put it in the chat. And I do have the French dressing recipe and we'll see if I can find it while you're talking and post that as well. Wonderful. I knew we had the, uh, you know, the ultimate woman in, in, um, uh, in recipes right here in our midst. Recipes were so popular that the railroads made them into little booklets and gave them to people. Uh, this one on the left is featuring the Southern Pacific head chef, the main one. And he's, uh, he's uh, looks like he's making up some batter. Next. Oh, and even recipes in hometowns uh, where they were very popular the uh, people would write into their local newspaper and sometimes the newspapers would publish the recipes. This is a great photo of all the food before this gentleman who's in the forefront of the photo and even the uh, cream and everything he's got there. Um, we don't eat quite like that even at Thanksgiving anymore. Next, this is a... Um, I'm sorry, uh, Baltimore and Ohio uh, photo. Rod Asman, the artist, uh, fantastic railroad artist, he's well known. This is a painting of the Southern Pacific daylight train. And uh, you can see the uh, Mount Shasta in the background. I show this too, not only because it's beautiful, but this train had a three car articulated diner built for it. So the diner had a kitchen in the middle. Next. So uh, I think we wanted to stop yeah, for a moment. To take a break and yeah. see if there are any questions in the chat, Kathy. Yes. Um, I... not on. Are there, do you wanna ask any? Yes. Um, Ann Burroughs uh, um, indicates that her paternal grandparents worked for a railroad in Arkansas as telegraphers 
and she's looking for any suggestions on how to research a possible company they worked for. Uh, what town in Arkansas does she know? It doesn't say here. Okay. Um, yeah, there were some trains through Arkansas and uh, there was one called the Texarkana and there were a couple others I think that touched base through Arkansas. So um, best thing she could do would be to uh, contact the library at the California State Railroad Museum and ask for some help in direction of how she might find uh, where they worked. If she knows the town they were in, that would be very helpful. There's some um, yearly guides called the railway guides uh, that would tell you what trains and also the maps of what trains at what time would or what year would be through her area. Hope that Thank helps. You. Thank you. Um, Stacy Walton just made a comment that her dad was promoted and retired as a steward on the California Zephyr. And then Sandy asks, where is the diner situated? Is it behind the engine in the middle of the train? Where is it on the train? Thank you, Jay. He put in a Arkansas Railroad link. So please Ooh, check that out in, in the chat. Oh, but that's wonderful, Jay. Yeah, Mary Ellen, can you try to make this into a single picture on the while uh, we're I stopped? Uh, yeah, while I'm doing it, I'm going to stop sharing for a second while you do it and switch to the one I was supposed to run instead of this. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, the other, <laughs> the other uh, question was, where did the dining car? Uh, reside in the consist of the train, normally around the center of the train. It usually was in front of the sleeper cars. The uh, oftentimes a buffet car was part of the dormitory car, and that would have been uh, more up front of the train. So there was various, but the lounge car often was the tail end uh, car like the uh, one, the pleasure car with the, with the turquoise room that was at the end of the train. Good question. Okay, so it, it depends. I mean, it, typically the middle, but sometimes it was uh, at a different spot. Where did the right. workers, Deb wants to know, where did the workers sleep? Well, very, very early sleeping cars, it was precarious because they would have to wait till everyone finished in the dining room. They'd set up these cots that sort of, you know, teetered on the tables between the tables and it didn't work out very well. Eventually the railroads created the dormitory car, which was more to the front of the train, but they have to work. They'd actually have to, after they finished work, uh, go through the front part of the train to their sleeping quarters. Okay, thank you. I think that is the last of the questions, but I do want to let uh, everyone who's on the call know that I've just entered two links. One is if you are not familiar with the Renaissance Society, and one is if you're enjoying tonight's program, Renaissance Cafe with all of their partner organizations has lots and lots of videos on the YouTube channel. And I've Ooh. entered that link as well for anybody who wants to copy that and save it. So I don't see any more questions, Marilyn, if you wanna continue. Uh, yes, I can continue with just uh, this particular G whiz fact before we get right back into the program. And um, the uh, dining car in 1925, just for your information, carried a thousand pieces of crockery and glass, 900 tablecloths, 700 pieces of silverware, food for 400 customers, a uh, fully equipped kitchen, and a crew of seven to 16 men. So you can see why the dining car was so expensive and it was the heaviest car in the train. 
it still is. The cafe cars are the heaviest car in the uh, Capitol Corridor, and it's in the center, basically, of the train. So now we're going to talk about <clears throat> the atmosphere. So that includes the interior design, the table settings, the china, and of course, the menus. And some of these are collectible. People love to collect them. Next. These are two famous name trains, the Broadway Limited and the 20th Century. They vied for passengers between Chicago and New York. Um, they continued to run, I think, into the 1960s. Next. This is a 1920s photo of a Union Pacific dining car. Um, and you can see the, the waiters wore long uh, um, 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 aprons, keep themselves clean. Next. Uh, one of my favorite designers, Mary Jane Coulter, designed uh, the interiors of railroad cars and whole trains, the super chief for Fred Harvey and the Santa Fe. On the right is a picture of one of the Membrano uh, pattern pieces she created just for the super chief, but it ran on a number of trains. It was so popular. It still is today. You can buy reproductions, I think, today. Mary Jane is in the picture on the upper part on the right hand side. Uh, she's got the, uh, the beautiful necklace on. The China next was fashioned after the member tribe or member valley ancient uh, Pueblo tribe. And she adapted it to China that could be. Uh, instead of one one hand piece at a time that was production oriented. I think she did a beautiful job. And you'll see the many different animals uh, featured on these different pieces of, of China. Um, I apologize for the silver being uh, so tarnished, but you can see there is the Santa Fe shell and that was used on a lot of the Santa Fe cars. Next. Ah, another favorite of mine is the uh, Southern Pacific Prairie Mountain Wildflowers. Um, you can see that uh, there were lots of different pieces. The silver pot on the right has the uh, uh, daylight uh, top to it. Uh, so there's a little bit of mixture in here. The other um, interesting fact about this china, it was used in the tea room of the Southern Pacific General Office building at number one market in San Francisco. Next. We have another woman designer, the first service engineer for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. She did lots of things, including helping design this uh, centenary um, pattern for the railroad dining car. The earliest production was 1927, and there were 26 different pieces in this set. Next. Uh, this is a, a an platter of the Great Northern Glory of the West uh, design, which was inspired by Glacier National Park. Uh, it, was, it was actually in production from 1940 to 1957. And it's uh, known as shadow tone, which I'm not quite sure what that means, but uh, it could be the fact of the softness of the mountains and everything. Next. In contrast, we have the Union Pacific Railroad winged streamliner. It's an odd shaped plate because it was a carving plate. 
the uh, streamliner is, uh, I think, still in use in the business cars. I know it was when I was working at the railroad museum some time ago. Next. Well, we can't look at menus without children's menus. Every, every major railroad had a menu just for kids. And here you say, see just a few of them. Uh, and uh, the, the children's menu in the center certainly has a lot to offer. Next. Keeping with the, the uh, tradition, Capital Quarter, uh, uses a menu uh, you can have for the uh, cafe car. They do, they do have a microwave, a toaster, and a way to uh, make coffee uh, aboard that car. So lots of these things, if they couldn't put it in a microwave, uh, probably you don't get anything hot. But uh, I remember my favorite was... Uh, the breakfast burrito, and I don't even see it mentioned there. But you can get beer and, and wine and, and um, um, you know, alcoholic beverages as well aboard the train. Next. This is certainly a sweet menu. The New York Central Sleeping Car Company Dining Car Service. And I love it because it has that little... Uh, uh, bow on top of it, the little ribbon, gives it an extra three dimension. Next. Menus uh, often had uh, artists' work on the front cover. They would tell the great landscapes, the people, the history. And notice this uh, particular menu was for the San Francisco Overland Limited. Next. In the right-hand upper corner, uh, this uh, gives you a little clue. Waiters are instructed neither to take nor to serve orders given orally. You have to put your order on those meal tickets that are, by, that are on your table. You write it down yourself, and often they would actually uh, read it back to you. This would be a way of keeping track of inventory too on the train. Next. Not to be outdone by the major railroads, uh, smaller railroads like the Yosemite Valley Railway had it catered food aboard the train. Another one was the Sacramento Northern and Interurban and it had a caterer who brought food aboard the train. Next. Well, by now you probably want to try a few recipes of your own. These three books all have great recipes in them, Dinner in the Diner, and that's by Will Hollister, The Dining Car Line to the Pacific. I really like that one. And that's by uh, William McKenzie and Dinner in the Diner by Will Hollister. That's a great one too. I mean, uh, not Will Hollister, it's uh, Dining by Rail, James Porterfield. There's another one too, but this one's uh, James Porterfield. That's the most current. Next. Dining car styles. I won't get into this. I mean, books have been written about some of these innovations. Uh, there were types of cars, the builders and designers. I'll just speak of a few of them. There were so many over the years, and then a few of the innovations that uh, occurred on dining cars. Next. Now there's, a, there's some um, tr uh, floor plans of several different kinds of dining cars. Um, there's one at the bottom that is the uh, lunch counter car, and then there's a cafe parlor car right above it, a cafe coach above that. So, and then the middle one is the observation car. Uh, all of them having food service. Next. The New York Central 20th, the New York Central 20th, 
Lim 20th Century Limited is leaving Chicago here. And it was designed from the outside uh, cowling of the steam engine to the swizzle sticks in the lounge by Henry Dreyfus, an industrial designer. Next. So of course the Pen Pennsylvanias could not um, be outdone and they had their railroad um, uh, streamlined and designed by Raymond Lowy, who was a great uh, designer of the time period. Uh, there's even a, a Art Nouveau, Art Deco toaster in MoMA in New York that he designed. So he did everything. Next. The most famous uh, in railroad circles for dining car builders in the lightweight division is the Bud Company. This was the front of their brochure. They uh, touted the round um, front of their locomotive. This was a, eventually a diesel. And you notice they have compared it to the ship's prow so that it would Speed through the air like a ship through the water. Next. Another designer uh, for uh, some of the, the um, bud cars, including the California Zephyr, was Paul Crete, architect and designer. He passed away before this train was done, and his partner, uh, Harvison, took over and worked with Bud Company. Beautiful train. Next. And of course, here in the Railroad Museum in Sacramento, there is a whole area devoted to dining cars. The Cochiti was built as the number one diner, lightweight diner for the Super Chief. We have a very important historic car. Next. There were tavern cars. This is a 1939 Southern Pacific car. Uh, many times celebrities were used to, to advertise the newest uh, innovations in railroads. Here you see um, a bar that uh, the, actually the California State Railroad Museum has the bar that she's leaning on in, in their collection. It was displayed at one time. Um, you see the bubbles and the glass, they're a different color. They are actually backlit, so it makes an interesting uh, presentation. Next. Innovation was the name, trying to get down uh, some of the costs to keep economics uh, for the railroad. And yet service uh, was still uh, an important uh, part on uh, food was an important part to the whole scheme. So they tried these lunch counters. You see there are a few booths behind it. <clears throat> Next. Uh, in an effort to make an economy train, uh, Santa Fe, had the El Capitan and it was delivered as an all bi-level train. Of course, Amtrak has used these uh, two-story uh, cars as, a, uh, uh, as part of their, their idea too. Next. Some other services, food served at your seat. So those were the following things you could have served at your seat. Uh, then uh, on the right-hand side, uh, Southern Pacific tried the automat, a buffet car. Uh, it cracks it. <laughs> I get a kick out of this. Shows the woman, uh, mom and her daughter having a great time with the automat car. I'm afraid they were not popular with uh, train riders. Next. Railroad cars and uh, trains uh, created innovations over the years. In 1880s, Pullman, um, Pullman's uh, 
Uh, this man worked for Pullman, H.H. H. Sessions. He created the enclosed vestibule. Now that was really important for dining cars because uh, you could go from one car to another now, from your sleeping car to the dining car without having to go outside or jump over couplers while the train was going. So these were enclosed, very safe ways to go from car to car. Another uh, innovation were disc brakes. They were created or put on early railroad cars by the Bud Company. They were very innovative. And uh, air conditioning was added. Uh, that of course was a problem because it was great for air conditioning, but the lightweight cars became heavier because of it. The use of something called flex wood created the curves and patterns of uh, beautiful inlaid uh, exotic woods that you see not only in the dining car, but other cars in the train. Yeah, it was utilized over plywood. And they piped music throughout the train. That was fun. Didn't have to stop and get it. Next, nobody had a boom box then. The Southern Pacific dining car, the Audubon, is uh, on the track there at the California State Railroad Museum. It was donated <clears throat> when Southern Pacific and Union Pacific uh, tied the knot and they gave this to the Railroad Museum. You can see it has the daylight uh, emblem on the side below the windows. 1952 car. The interior has birds, and you can see a couple of the bird medallions at the end of the uh, car. This is decorated for Polar Express, which we hope the Railroad Museum will be able to bring back this winter. Next, very popular. I think this is a very interesting car until I started working on this program. I didn't know much about it. It's called the Little Nugget. Um, it was built in 1937, early by the Pullman Standard Car Manufacturing Company as part of the Union Pacific and Chicago and Northwestern Railroads. It was the, it was the uh, dining car for the new passenger train, the city of Los Angeles. Again, an all first class Pullman. This car is, is, survives. It's now at the Travel Town in Los Angeles, and they are hoping to get enough money to refurbish it. Next. Well, to carry on the tradition, we have. Um, Amtrak in the center, that's a Coast Starlight, and then a Capitol Corridor on the right. They are awaiting at the Sacramento State uh, Depot. And so they're trying to carry on food service in both types of trains. Next. Acknowledgements. Uh, I have a few, I know there are many more. But at least uh, here, I want to say thank you to Mary Ellen Burns and uh, Paul Hellman, Tom Herzog, and of course, a big thank you to the California State Railroad Museum. One more thing, uh, next slide. Well, maybe you feel like you'd like a rail dining experience. This is the Santa Fe Super Chief. But Nowadays, besides Amtrak and Via Rail in Canada, there are still enjoyable rail dining experiences throughout America. Uh, one comes to mind for me, the Napa Valley wine train comes, uh, you know, close to being here near us. And also right across the Sacramento River is the Sacramento Murder Mystery Dinner Train, which I don't know what kind of dinner they serve, but it sounds like a lot of fun. Again, thank you for listening and I hope you've enjoyed it. Perhaps maybe be inspired a little. Nope.
couple of comments about some of the um, the uh, information in chat. I just want to point out that Esther added that this was um, co-hosted tonight by the Sacramento River Delta Historical Society. There is an email that was also entered if you want to uh, contact someone. She entered an email and their website, srdhs.org. Um, Marilyn, we have several people that just want to say thank you for a very interesting presentation. It was fabulous. Anne asks if you could give us your thoughts on the future of train travel. Uh, I'm very optimistic on the future of train travel. Uh, I read a book when I was uh, very early on working for the California State Railroad Museum and it stopped in the 1950s. And the Railroad Museum thought about stopping things in the 1950s and not add anything else. Well, train travel has moved on. Uh, I think the Capitol Quarter is about to have its 30th anniversary. Um, there's a lot of uh, interest in railroads in the East, especially there are electric um, uh, locomotives that run on catenary. Uh, of course, out here, the uh, diesel electric run on onboard uh, generators, but they run on traction motors, electricity. So I think there's a lot of room for trains of tomorrow uh, that will, will be coming along. Thank you. And Jay, who appreciate his input. Um, he said the future of train travel and gave a website. Um, oh, wonderful. I'm just basically plugging high speed rail as the future of train travel. Yeah, hsr.ca.gov. Thank you very much, Ray. Mary Ellen, you had a few questions. Yeah, I have a few questions, but I also uh, wanted to thank Marilyn uh, so much. I also wanted to let everyone know that there was a, a, a time of, uh, in the fall where we did something called Dining on the Rails as well with Alter Egos, which was an actual Reader's Theater production. We're going to be sending this link and that link to everyone who attends today. And even though some of those people didn't sign up for this one, so everyone's gonna get everything. We produced a program that has quite a few uh, recipes in it. So we'll be adding that as well, including George Dunlap's smothered chicken. Um, let me ask just one um, uh, question and then we'll throw it back to uh, Kathy who can do the chat. And, and that is Marilyn, I just took a, um, overnighter roomette on the California Zephyr to Colorado in October. The worst food I think I've ever eaten in my life. Uh, everything is frozen, same menu is kind of everywhere. I know you just talked about the, you know, the, the future, but um, what do you think the, the future of food is? Do you think we're ever going to go back to um, these kinds of, of meals or do you think we're gonna be doing microwave for a long time to come? Well, the first microwave was on the Rock Island. Uh, there was a microwave on the El Capitan, but they still had good food. I'm not sure what Amtrak's doing. I think your food was probably included with your, your ticket. Mm -hmm. um, that's too bad that you had a bad experience, and I hope that uh, they straighten their, their whole situation out. Um, People, you know, they had dining car China to begin with. Then they went to paper plates and people were in an uproar. So uh, what they need is feedback and say, your food was yuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I do have one more question before it goes back to Kathy. And this is very specific to Sacramento. The Southern Pacific was building dining cars as well um, in, in Sacramento. Are any of those um, on view where we can actually see what it was that they produced? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. You know, Mary Helmick did the book on the Sacramento uh, Southern Pacific shops. I do know that they produced the first steel car, but it was not a diner. And I don't know if there's any 
diners still around? Um, that'd be a good question. And I'll ask Mary tomorrow because I'm having tea with her. Kathy, back to you. We have a comment from Anne. She said, my grandmother took my sister and I through the Feather River Canyon. Can you comment? Oh, that's a beautiful ride. She's lucky to have had that. Uh, that was the uh, Western Pacific California Zephyrs route. Uh, when, it, uh, when it went down, if there's a problem with the California Zephyr, which is the Amtrak train that goes over Donner Pass, it will go through the Feather River Canyon. Mm -hmm. And so rail buffs, I'm told, call that rare mileage, whatever that means. <laughs> so she had a wonderful experience. That's a beautiful trip. Thank you. Um, the question from Ruth is, are there, to your knowledge, any diner restaurants still active in the area? They were very popular during the 50s. I do have one slide I almost put in of one in Buffalo, New York. <laughs> but uh, there used to be in San Francisco a few of them. I don't have images of them. Um, they were like... Oh, what were they called? Something hot dog or dog or, I know what she means, but I don't know if there are any still in existence. Okay. Anne asks, she, or actually she says, I understand you designed the table setting for the dining, I think it's car, at the railroad museum. Can you tell us about that process? I'm not quite sure what she's asking. I didn't design any china or anything. Uh, maybe she wants to know about the, uh, the way they're displayed. Yeah, I think that's probably it, how you set it up. Ah, okay, okay. The, uh, yeah, there's a, you know, every, there are always cheap tricks in, in, in uh, exhibit department. And one of them is we only change the tablecloths under the cases. There's a tablecloth that's permanent in the case. And what we do is vacuum and spot clean it. Uh, the others, though, have to be removed. We have to remove the case and take the tablecloth out and then put it back in. So those uh, plexis were actually uh, a fellow I worked with designed the curve and had them fabricated. They were quite expensive. And uh, we take them apart, or I used to, now they still do. You take them apart to get to the uh, china and everything to clean things uh, and polish the silver if necessary. Thank you. What is the status of the rehab for the railroad shops? Do you know? No, I don't know much about uh, other than what I see in the newspapers and everything seems to be up in the air right now because of the COVID. Hopefully things will be back in place. Uh, the <clears throat> Railroad Museum still has uh, the, uh, a couple of the buildings there and uh, hopefully they'll be able to keep them and one of them will eventually become the Museum of Railroad Technology. That's the plan. Okay, great. Thank you. Sandy would like to know what determines the length of a train? Oh, <laughs> it goes from the engine to the end. No, I'm sorry. Uh, you, that's, that's interesting because trains can be uh, the definition of a train is a locomotive with flags so or signals. So it can be just one locomotive or it can have all kinds of cars behind it, uh, depending on passenger or freight. They can be very, very long. The traits now are over a mile and a half long. Um, so it, it can vary. There's uh, even... The Bud Company produced something called the railroad diesel uh, car, the RDC, and that was a single unit that ran on the track. 
it was small in comparison to a full train. So it was a little more economical to go to um, less frequented places. Okay, thank you. Great. And, and Kathy, I have, oh, you have one from Ruth and then I have a question. Yes. Can you comment on the loss of the caboose on trains? Ah, the caboose, yes. Now we have the um, uh, Fred, the flashing uh, device at the end of the last car. The caboose uh, was very expensive for railroads. And once they became dieselized, uh, they were able to put the conductor up in the locomotive with the engineer. And you don't have so many brakemen anymore, so they didn't have to have a place to be. However, when the conductor, I have a friend, and she, she says when, <laughs> you know, when an air hose breaks, the train stops, she has to walk that mile and a half <laughs> to find that hose. So it takes a little longer, but I guess with freight, they're not as important. Uh, there's some shorter freight trains that are a uh, priority. So yeah, yeah, it's a, it, it's a matter of economics. Uh, I still miss uh, waving to somebody at the end of the train <laughs> myself. Good. And I believe that's all the questions. I have, I have another question. Okay. <laughs> One more. <laughs> and, and I might throw this to Stacy uh, Walton. I, I've done a lot of research on um, uh, uh, Blacks uh, in the dining service. George Dunlap is one. I had the good fortune of being able to spend quite a few hours with Thomas Fleming, who wrote extensively about his experiences in the uh, commissary and uh, two of my neighbors who own houses, um, fathers bought a row of three different houses because working on in the dining cars, literally, or as stewards or as Pullman, allowed them to solidly go into the, um, the middle class. Um, but here's my question. Women, I, I haven't heard very much about women who work in the commissary. So were there women that were working or was it a really a man's world? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have seen a little bit about women who uh, waitressed for a while, but it didn't work out. I don't know what happened. Um, I just saw that in passing. So that's something to delve into. The women were normally uh, worked as uh, car cleaners at the end of the run. So I don't know if there were any in the commissaries. That would be a good question. And when, when and if they did, um, maybe during the uh, both world wars or Korea or something, they, they employed women. I know they did in the shops. Bertie asks, will the snow train to Sparks, Nevada be resumed? Oh, let's hope so. <laughs> I, I haven't heard anything. I, I'm not sure that that company is still in operation. Mm. I think COVID kind of brought them down. Uh, whether it be resurrected, we'll just have to keep watching to see for news. Thank you. Mary Ellen, did you have any other questions? Yeah, uh, um, uh, I've got, uh, yeah, but that would bore everyone else. And that <laughs> I might make an announcement. Uh, Denny Anspach, who Marilyn talked about earlier, was really instrumental. Um, Tom Hammer, there are other people who are very instrumental in, in developing the, um, the California State Railroad Museum. I'm lucky I spent 34 hours with Denny uh, on tape before he died. And so mm. I'm going to in producing um, a book. I am hoping that Marilyn will validate some of the stuff. She might know what some of the, the history. So there's going to be more on this subject coming. Uh, I Ooh. just want everyone to know. Uh, this isn't the only time we're going to be talking about food on the trains. Um, I like just, I want to recreate an oyster train. But I want to thank Marilyn very much for um, uh, coming tonight. We're going to have Kathy do her little um, thank you a little bit more about Renaissance. Um, let me tell you about the Sacramento River Delta Historical Society first. We are um, 
um, serve everyone that's uh, uh, around the Delta. We do have an office at the Gene Harvey um, Center in, in um, Walnut Grove. Uh, Esther um, Hootman, who is here, actually keeps that resource center open one day a week on Tuesdays. I don't think we're doing it right now, but she'll be making appointments as well. We have oral histories and everything else. <laughs> Wonderful organization. We're going to be doing more things in tandem with Renaissance, but also finally doing in person. So we will be sending you information about that. I'm going to give it to Kathy and then we will close and then ask if anybody uh, in the green room would like to share a personal story um, or ask more questions. So uh, Kathy, to you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. I've already put into chat information about Renaissance and the YouTube. If you are interested in other historical programs, culinary programs, programs about art, all kinds of things. I think I counted them up and there's something like I don't know, 60 videos in there. Um, what I am inviting folks to now is a another virtual meeting. This one is, is going to be given by another community group, a partner of Renaissance, and that's Friendship Force. And we will be talking about um, things to do here in what I'm going to call the greater Sacramento area. It's really hmm. from Oakland in the East Bay, up through Modesto, Stockton, Lodi, some gardens in California, in Sacramento and Davis, up to Historic Folsom, out to Calaveras, and then up to Reno. So it's really going to be fun. Great day trips. Great, even if you just have half a day, you can get to some of these places. A number of them are cross-cultural because that's one of the focuses of Friendship Force. We host people and we travel and stay with nationals wherever we go. So I've dropped in there the invitation to that presentation. It's this coming Sunday at three o'clock. You're all invited. You would sign up on Eventbrite. For those of you who signed up on Eventbrite, I will also send the link. Um, Mary Ellen's went ahead and put her email in there. I think that's all of my announcements, Mary Ellen. You want me to stop the recording? Yes. So I, again, will thank Marilyn um, uh, again. Marilyn, if you could just wait with us for a few minutes and thank mm -hmm. everyone for joining us, especially the Eventbrite people. Make sure that you follow us so that you find out more about these events. And thank you all for coming.